Right, we'll, we'll make a start, um, and no doubt there'll be a few more people that will, will trickle in. Um, and, and thanks for coming back for the second session, which um, will be on, on trade policy in a changing global environment. But, but just before we move on to that, just another housekeeping issue. We do have a mobile telephone that's been uh, found and a parking voucher. So uh, if either of those items or both of those belong to you, please go see uh, Cheryl Brown at, at registration. So I'll introduce our next speaker, uh, Sarah Wyant, who is president of the AgriPulse Communications. As a veteran farm policy reporter, Sarah is well recognized on Capitol Hill, as well as within the farm and community associations across America. Her newsletter and website, AgriPulse, includes the latest updates for on-farm policy, commodity and conservation program, trade, food safety, rural development, and environmental and regulatory programs. Sarah also publishes an early morning news summary called Daily Harvest, providing busy readers with a quick overview on the latest farm, food, and rural policy news. In 2015, Sarah was named in the annual Folio magazine in their section on entrepreneurs category as one of the top women in media. Sarah gained a first-hand knowledge of crop and livestock production whilst growing up on a farm near, I'm, I'm apology, my apology for not being able to pronounce this, in, in, in Iowa, and is still involved with her farm, family's farming operation. She and husband Alan Parents of sons Jason and Jordan also own the farm where her husband's family originally established a homestead near Almond, North Dakota. Sarah's keynote address is on the outlook for US and global agriculture policy post-Trump and other global political changes. Again, please interact, ask questions. Either we'll have roving microphones or use um, the availability of texting 0411 Five six four one two eight. Thank you, Sarah. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. And thanks for inviting me and Rosemary for, and for all the organi organizers and the sponsors. I really appreciate the invitation to fly across the pond for 20 hours or so from <laughs> our offices in Washington, D.C. and in central Missouri to talk to you about the environment for trade under the Trump administration. And I'd like to start with doing something that I don't normally do, but because I'm not as familiar as all, with all of you as I would with the United States crowd, I want to have a little bit of a disclaimer. And that is because I am a journalist, and I am the founder of AgriPulse with a team of journalists in Washington, DC, that, as Stephen mentioned, produce informational products. So every morning, we are out with the Daily Harvest. Even before that, we have a piece that goes out called Daybreak. That's a perspective on what's happening on Capitol Hill. We do an in-depth newsletter that will be going to subscribers. Uh, on actually early, when I get done with this uh, presentation, it will be heading out. And then we also update our website. So I am a journalist that is trained in trying to call them as we see them. I'm not here to be an apologist for the Trump administration. I'm not here to be someone who wants to uh, represent them in ways or tell stories about them. Uh, and do an impression of John Donald Trump. I think your Australian Prime Minister has that down. <laughs> so uh, what I'm going to tell you is based on discussions with a lot of different folks. Many of our subscribers are within the Beltway. They represent American Farm Bureau, the nation's largest farm organization, National Grain and Feed, National Cattlemen's, National Pork Producers, National Farmers Union, all the major trade organizations that lobby on behalf of farmers and ranchers in the country that have lobbying groups in Washington, D.C. are some of our subscribers. But 77% of our audience is actually out in the countryside. And we make a big point of talking to them on a regular basis. 
not just my home state of Iowa or where my husband and I have a farm in North Dakota, but all around the country. And we also conduct nationwide research. So we do a lot to try to really keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening in American agriculture. Now having said that, and trying to make you understand we are not fake news, um, we also are very cognizant of what others are saying and how they're portraying some of the changes in this administration. Some of it's just a little too good to pass up. Uh, this was a New York Post headline that ran just four days ago comparing the Trump administration to the TV series Survivor. And you can see through the caricatures who some of the, the keen people are in this, including President Trump in the middle, and then of course uh, Reigns Priebus, who uh, was chief of staff, and Anthony Scaramucci, Mucha, who was uh, communications director for almost four days. Uh, before now being out. So, you know, things change quickly in Washington. You have to keep an eye on things all the time. The news cycle, when I started my career, enabled us to do a weekly. Now we're pretty much 24-7 trying to keep an eye on things, and partially because we know the president likes to tweet. And I don't see this stopping anytime soon. Uh, and his tweets are far-ranging. He goes from bashing uh, Senator Mikowski from uh, Alaska for her vote on health care reform, which as you probably know now is, is a dead issue for the time being in, in the United States, to announcing a ban on transgenders in the media, to then also going after his attorney general, Jeff Sessions, a senator who was early to back him and now is apparently on the outs. So I think the president is going to continue to tweet. He commands the news cycle that way. The only change I've seen since he has now named a new chief of staff, General Kelly, is that he has not bashed any individual personally in the last 24 hours. So he's been talking about the stock market hitting historic highs, and he's been talking about all the changes that he's making that are really good for the US economy. So for a little while now, we've got a reprieve. <clears throat> now, some of you may be asking, how in the world did this happen with the US elections? I'm sure that you've seen a lot of the headlines, and you probably watched uh, with a great uh, degree of interest while we were having the primaries. I have to say that, and several times I thought that Donald Trump would not be the Republican nominee. There were different things that happened, different statements made, but then I'd go out into the countryside and people would tell me, we want something different. We do not want anything similar to what we had the last eight years. They felt, and your shadow minister mentioned this earlier, they felt disenfranchised, they felt left out, they felt that their economic opportunities had been capped, and they really wanted something different. And I can tell you whether they were Republicans or Democrats in farm country, some of the Democrats that voted for Donald Trump did not think that Hillary Clinton was different enough. They thought she would be more of the same, and when her chief rival on the Democratic side, who was Senator Bernie Sanders from Vermont, said he wanted to get out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. She changed her position to wanting to get out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. But a lot of the Democrats I talked to said, we think she's gonna change back to what she was under the Obama administration as Secretary of State, and that she will reverse her position. So the protectionism that was bubbling up on the Democratic side and also from some in the, in the Republican side really surfaced to elevate Donald Trump uh, not only through the primary but onto the general election. And so I think it's important to understand that he was tapping into a, a base of voters that felt he was listening to them for the first time, that he was a businessman, not a politician, and that he was going to be different. Well, he certainly is. It's very different. And so we spent a lot of time trying to interpret what does that mean for agriculture and more broadly for trade policy. Well, one thing we do know is that the people who elected him were in what a lot of people on both coasts call flyover country. 
It's not the New York, Washington, D.C., uh, East Coast liberal branch. It's not the San Francisco, L.A., West Coast. It's Iowa, Wisconsin, his ability to flip traditionally blue states like Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania and Ohio. So even though Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, he was able to play the Electoral College in a way that led to his win. And this map, or versions of this, have been very critical in convincing the president on trade policy issues. Because when he gets into a position where he says, well, let's scrap the Trans-Pacific Partnership, people say, OK, but let's think about what does that mean to the farmers and ranchers. The same on NAFTA, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The North American Free Trade Agreement, he apparently was on the very edge of throwing that all the way out the door. But some of his advisors brought in a map to show who is going to be hurt by a decision like that to totally withdraw. So we're going into renegotiation. So on the campaign trail, then candidate Trump did not do a lot to offer specifics. The ones he did offer were very broad brush promises. And if you ever went to a campaign rally, people could chant these out like you know they were, they were their um, long held beliefs. He was going to build the wall, secure the border. He wanted to temporarily ban refugees, bring manufacturing back to the US. Again, he's speaking to that base of voters who felt they were disenfranchised by a previous administration. We already talked about withdrawing from TPP and renegotiating NAFTA. Repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, a key campaign promise which now has just lo looked like it stalled in our Congress, and I can't see it coming back any anytime soon. Cut taxes, make it better for the middle class, cut regulations, downsize the federal government, drain the swamp of lobbyists, many of whom are advising still in the, uh, this administration. But the one thing that he said repeatedly in farm country, despite having a lot of his advisors being affiliated with the oil in industry, is that he was going to maintain the renewable fuel standard. So that's why I wanted to point this out, especially from our previous discussion. This was the only ag policy position outside of trade that he was clear as can be. Why would that be? Well, he wanted Iowa Governor Terry Branstad and his son, Eric, who was running his campaign in Iowa, to flip that state back to Republican for Trump. And they did. He also wanted to make sure that farmers and ranchers who were his core advisory committee, who supported the RFS, knew that he had their back. So one thing, if, if you're not familiar, during the first run for presidency, Barack Obama had an agricultural advisory committee, and it was made up of farmers and ranchers and lobbyists and uh, ex-government officials, and they kept him focused on a rural vote. Not in his re-election so much, but he had an advisory committee. Trump had an advisory committee on steroids. It was a who's who of American agriculture that had any affiliation with the Republican Party. And so they were always talking about things he needed to do, people that he needed to pick for his top nominees. And so they were very influential throughout the campaign. And now that he's been elected, they still carry quite a bit of sway. Now we understand, we understand that US farmers are less than 2% of the United States population. But every time one of these farm leaders gets up to talk, they remind him and they remind his administration that they helped him get elected, farmers and rural voters collectively. So this is some of the things that he said during the campaign. What has he actually done? Well, let's be honest. He issued a series of executive orders early on, and they sounded quite good. It sounded like he could do something, right? He was going to be very active. He's got this business acumen. He's going to get out there, and he's going to do something right away, keep his campaign promises. So he's going to build a wall and secure the border and the refugee ban. Of course, you know that's tied up in the courts now. Um, he's gotten some wins out of that and a lot more losses and a lot of confusion. 
manufacturing jobs. He's been touting that. And as we've mentioned, he hasn't been able to cut uh, the Affordable Care Act or taxes quite yet. But he issued these orders that said he was going to do certain things and kind of move the ball forward. But of course, in the United States, we have three branches of government. He is the head of the executive branch. OK, got it. But he also needs to have the legislative branch take action on things like health care and tax reform, and the judicial branch, which is going to have to interpret some of these court challenges and make rulings on whether or not they will stand or not. So promises made, but not necessarily promises kept yet. So I guess you have to say, you know, on a scorecard of things that he has done, especially for American agriculture, he's created some uncertainty. The action to withdraw from TPP has made people very, very nervous. American agriculture was largely in support of the changes that were going to be made. He says, no more multilaterals. You know, we'll renegotiate NAFTA, but we want only bilaterals, and we want to rethink some of the existing trade agreements in addition to NAFTA, the South Korean FTA, and others. I mentioned it was really a last minute thing before he decided to renegotiate, not withdraw from NAFTA. And that's because he had a couple people in at the last minute, a clutch meeting to change his mind. The direction to secure the border and enhance security, uh, that has created a lot of confusion out in farm country because some of the immigrants, you know, we get their papers, they go into dairies and they go into feedlots and they say, here's my papers, they're legal, everything's fine. Farmers don't have a lot of ways to check whether those are 100% legal. But after Trump started cracking down on illegal immigrants, bumping up border security, some of these people just went home. I've talked to dairymen who said, I went to work one day, and some of my employees said, I just don't want to risk it anymore. I'm going to leave. I've talked to landscapers who used to have a great supply of Hispanic labor. They couldn't find them this summer. So the labor force and the uncertainty for a lot of farmers and ranchers has added to their angst about what's going on in the administration. And I have to say that there's a lot of appreciation for what he could do on infrastructure. But again, we've got a Congress, and we've got folks who are saying, where's the money going to come from? Are we going to do private-public partnerships and have this outside investment? You know, how's that going to work? So he has not advanced infrastructure either. And then, of course, I don't have to tell any of you, when you look at the tweets, when you look at some of the statements, the chaos that has engulfed the staff at the White House has really deterred from his agenda. So it's made it more difficult for people to really say, OK, this president is delivering to this point. But then again, you go out and you talk to farmers and ranchers. Why, what do you think? Are you still with them? I mean, we did a nationwide survey during the primary, during the general election. All of that showed that people were willing to support Trump. We've got a new one that's out in the field right now. I'll have the results in a couple of weeks. And I'll be shocked if the support for him has really declined dramatically. I had a woman in our office from Minnesota last week who said, you know, Sarah, every day is Christmas since we elected President Trump. I said, really? <laughs> How so? And she just said, I feel like a burden has been lifted off of our back. So I'm going to go through five of the key reasons, five of the key reasons that I hear most from farmers and ranchers about why they support this administration to just give you a feel for where they're coming from. One of the first ones is regulatory reform. There is a general sense that there had been a burden on their back in terms of red tape and regulations that were making it more difficult for farmers just to farm. We call these freedom to operate issues in the United States. And there was a real interest in, you know, we want to be stewards of the land. We want to raise our families. We want to bring the next generation up in agriculture. Just let us do our job. And one of the rallying cries for the Trump administration was to get rid of what's called the Waters of the U.S. rule. WOTUS is the acronym that people use. 
And when Trump came into office, he issued this executive order that said, if you're going to do any new regulations, you're going to have to take two back. And he's got people working on that. But he said from the very start, one of the things we want to do is repeal WOTUS. And what this rule did was it defined what was considered a navigable water on farmlands. And then expanded it significantly from what had been what you would think, a navigable water, boats can go on it, that sort of thing, to smaller uh, areas that were small little streams and ditches. And so the agricultural community writ large pretty much said, we've got to get rid of this rule. And in an interview with the Wall Street Journal this week, when asked about his most significant accomplishments yet to date, the president said, I've made it people, possible for pe people to be able to control their land and to farm their farms in reference to get re getting rid of WOTUS. So this is an issue that really won a lot of support for him. And I have to say, it wasn't just Republicans. It was Democrats. When we researched it and did a, our, our nationwide poll, it was younger farmers, older farmers, uh, small farmers, large farmers, they felt that they needed more freedom to operate. So this regulatory reform talking point for the president is a home run in farm country. One of the other things that probably isn't talked about enough is that his pick for the Supreme Court is seen as a barrier to a lot of the challenges that have been coming up from the environmental community and from those groups that farmers feel very anxious about. Judge Neil uh, Gorsuch, as you may know, his mother was a former administrator of the EPA in a previous Republican administration. He is viewed as a constitutionalist who wants to <clears throat> interpret the law as it's originally been written and intended under the Constitution. And he's viewed as a very important member of the Supreme Court that will uphold some of these challenges that have been coming up through agencies. Uh, and I'm sure this happens in, in your country and others, but what had been happening increasingly in the United States is that an agency like USDA, the Department of Agriculture, or our Environmental Protection Agency would issue a rule and then it would be challenged by some groups who said, oh no, we can't have those kinds of pesticides being applied on farms and ranches, it's too dangerous. And instead of the EPA coming back and saying, oh, well, we've got science on our side, we think we're good, we're going to still do this, the challenge would come up through the courts, and oftentimes the agency would back off. So having the ability to appoint not only the Supreme Court justice, and I don't think this will be his last one, but federal judges and to stack the courts up with people who are more friendly to the business community is seen as a big win for the administration. Another thing is that he's got a, a handful of advisors. I can't tell you how many people are really running these agencies right now. It's not very many. We have a secretary of agriculture confirmed. We don't have a deputy secretary. We don't have any undersecretaries. Um, you know, the cabinet is full now, but it took a lot longer than for other administrations. But the president does have a special advisor on agriculture. His name's Ray Starling, and he's pictured here in this slide. And I have to say that when you see what Starling has done, he reports the national economic advisor, Gary Cohen. And when you see Sonny Perdue, and you see Wilbur Ross at Commerce, and you see some of these people talking, you get the vibe that it's a much more entrepreneurial, quick-working administration than you've seen in the past. And I'm saying that over both Republican and some Democratic administrations. It's not really about the policies. It's just it's, it's this ability to move things quickly. And this is just one example. We have a National Agriculture Day. And you know it's a day to step back and celebrate. It's the first day of spring. And you know, for a lot of administrations, we have in agriculture said, boy, it'd be nice if the president would once say the word farm, if he'd say the word agriculture, if he'd mention a rancher here and there, maybe State of the Union, something like that. And it usually doesn't happen. 
But here you've got the new team coming in. You've got this special advisor. And he says, yeah, you know, we haven't had one of these proclamations since Bill Clinton in 1993. So in two weeks, two weeks, he goes to work to see if he can get this drafted. And, and I talked to him like the day before he was going to finalize it. And he said, I think we're close. I think we're really close. We're on Air Force One right now, and we're finalizing the language. You know, that just hasn't happened for the agriculture community for a long time. To have some administration really talk the talk, or as Ray says, brag on ag. Now, it has to be followed through with substance. We know that. We have to have actions. But the talking points are very loud and clear that this administration understands and wants to support agriculture. They've got this task force on rural prosperity. I think this is a number four reason why farmers are saying, OK, they're going to sit down there and, and collectively, Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary of Transportation, Commerce, head of the Federal Communications Committee, Ray Starling, uh, Health and Human Services, they're all sitting down. This is a cafeteria in USDA, the Department of Agriculture. And they're talking about how can we make it better, more business friendly in agriculture in, in the United States. And their report's due here in October, so we'll see what they can come up with. Again, the words have to be followed by actions, but for right now, farmers and ranchers are tending to give them the benefit of the doubt to see what this new team can come up with. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't mention what the Trump administration has already done for China. And I'll explain a couple of photos here. <clears throat> These are actually taken not too far from where I grew up. I was able to go with the, the Trump team when they landed in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, for uh, three events. The first one was uh, to highlight technical training, two-year training on how to uh, drive a combine and technical skills in agriculture at Kirkwood Community College. The next one was a standing room only event uh, for agricultural leaders, and the last one was an event, uh, a campaign style rally in downtown Cedar Rapids. So here's President Trump. He gets off the plane with the former governor of Iowa, Terry Branstad, who's shown in that top photo with President Trump. Now, Governor Branstad was a friend of, of the Chinese President Xi Jinping from really some of his early trips to Iowa back to 1985. So we think that this is a key appointment, having the governor uh, as ambassador in China. And it's also very apparent that the first meeting that Trump and Xi had seemed to go off fairly well. Um, they met at Mar-a-Lago in Florida. They had launched a 100-day plan. And since that time, we've seen access to US beef in China, US rice in China, and approval of some, not all pending biotech trades, but some. So it's viewed as a major victory in farmer ranch country that these doors have been opened to China. Now, what's going to happen if North Korea continues to take aim at the United States with their missiles? I don't know. The president has tried to apply pressure on China in order to put pressure on North Korea. Uh, apparently, there's consideration of sanctions going on yet this week. I wish I knew the answer to that, and I wish it did not involve military action. But um, there could be some decisions made that make this whole situation and environment, the early love between uh, the US and the Chinese, not be as strong. But I did talk to a bunch of Iowans, our Secretary of Agriculture, our new governor, a bunch of farm leaders just came back from there. They are more bullish than ever before on the ability to do more trade with China. But farmers aren't all happy campers. You know what's happening with commodity prices. And we've got net farm income headed in the wrong direction, down to 62.3 billion. It's about a 9% drop. There's that nervousness that you know a few years ago, they were making a lot of money. Farmland prices were going like this. Cash rent prices were going like this. Incomes were going like this. And now the trend is the other direction. So there's a big concern out there that if we don't get these trade deals moving forward, and if we don't keep 
the feet under the fire of the administration, that other countries like Australia, like some of the other folks that are able to fill that void, whether Ukraine or South America, will step in. And so that does have the farmers and ranchers a little bit on a nervous edge here as they look at how to judge the administration. And of course, uh, some of your previous speakers have already talked about this. We've got a lot of drought in the northern plains. The moisture has not been what it seemed to be. I got a picture from my sister-in-law yesterday. All the yards in North Dakota, the, the, all of the pastures are dried up. Uh, we've got friends in Montana and, and uh, western North Dakota where there's been fires, uh, rangeland, hundreds of thousands of acres have burned. And then on the other extreme, in more the eastern Corn Belt, there's been too much water standing in fields and cornfields right now. So there's a lot of uncertainty, as there always is, of course, over the extremes with the weather. And then the key test, of course, right now for farmers and ranchers as they try to judge the Trump administration going forward is what will you do with the North American Free Trade Agreement? And I have to say that the early going on this after it was decided to renegotiate instead of withdraw was that uh, the farm groups got their act together and negotiated with the Trump administration on really what they wanted. First was do no harm. We really like our access for the most part with Canada and Mexico. They're consistently two, three, or four as our top trading partners. Secretary Perdue went to Mexico last week to meet with uh, his counterpart in Mexico. He came back saying, everything's fine. They realize that they have a great relationship with the U.S. I really don't think they were doing anything but negotiating when they said they were going to start buying from the South Americans. <clears throat> That's not what our U.S. Grains Council says. Our Grains Council says they are going to start buying in August and September. So we're, we're going to find out whether the Mexicans are, are going to be a little tougher negotiators than Secretary Perdue thought at first or not. Uh, but we'll also see negotiations begin in er earnest on August 16th, and time will tell how we come out with this. But let's face it, the U.S. Trade Representative already knew what Mexico and Canada were willing to give under the Trans-Pacific Partnership, right? So if we can just improve the agreement by embracing those changes that they were willing to give, and then of course there's a strong interest by our dairy sector, our poultry sector, and um, some of our fruit and vegetable growers to make some additional changes. But if we can make some of those without doing harm to the agricultural sector, I think this will be viewed as a victory. But of course, time is also of the essence, and that was the main message, I think, from a House Agricultural Committee meeting uh, last week that basically had a score of different commodity groups in the U.S. saying, hurry up, get this done, get it fixed. We want to be back to selling more product. Uh, the numbers aren't lying about the fact that we are seeing some improvements. Our USDA says uh, agricultural exports in total, all exports, not just feed and grains, at 137 billion, up a billion from what was forecast in February. We'd like to see that number go higher, of course, but grain and feed exports are at 29 billion, up 400 million. Cotton exports, 400 million to, five, uh, to 54 billion and oil seed and product exports at 31.7 billion, up 100 million, and I think that's gonna to continue to increase from the people that I've been talking to. And you can see from this little chart how important trade is depending on the different commodities that we export, whether 70% of cotton, 70% of tree nuts, 50% of our soybeans, 50% of wheat, rice, and sorghum, on average uh, equivalent to 20% of net farm income. Farmers know that trade is important and they want to enhance it. And our congressmen know that trade is important. And during the last farm bill, they decided that USDA should be reorganized to re appoint a new undersecretary, one of the top reporters, uh, candidates reporting to the secretary. And this person would be focused solely on trade. 
The nominee has been named, it's Ted McKinney. He's been the director of agriculture in Indiana, and he'll be a strong advocate for trade if he can get through the Senate confirmation process. He won't have much opposition, but our Senate is about ready to go out on recess, and so some of these nominees could not possibly be considered until September uh, at the rate that they're going now. So I want to leave you with just a couple of parting thoughts because I'm, I'm so eager to hear the rest of the speakers at this conference. And my, from my perspective, I'm talking about the government's role. But I think there are a lot of things going on in the marketplace that I find very, very interesting in, in how those uh, vectors are going to shape the future of agricultural policy. I think we've seen a lot of disruption. I know we have in the communications field. You know, I started my career typing on a typewriter and using carbon paper to have the duplicate. And now I can take out my iPhone and edit and write stories and send them around the world. We've seen similar disruption in a lot of different technologies. And then we've seen consolidation. You've got ChemChina buying Syngenta in Switzerland, Dow and DuPont to US-based companies, Bayer and Monsanto. Uh, this picture here is of President Wren, president of ChemChina. I had a chance to meet him in Switzerland last month, and very impressive man. And I can't help but believe that he is going to continue to boost the technology play in China, whether it's the embracement of more biotech traits or the enhancement of more data-driven agriculture. I think he seemed like a, really on the cutting edge of what he wanted to do in that country. And then on the consumer end, you're also seeing things like Amazon buying Whole Foods. What a disruptor for our grocery industry. You've got the big brands like Kroger and, and Safeway and others saying, wow, what's going to happen if these millennials, who have a lot of disposable income in our country, just order it up on Amazon and a drone delivers their food and they stop going to retail. It's already happening in a lot of the big department stores. You go to a mall in the United States right now, good luck finding many people. They're ordering online. So is this the future of our food system where we're going to be connecting a grower to an online provider and to some sort of a drone delivery system? Are we going to see more consumer interest? We've already seen quite a bit, but more consumer interest in branded products, even branded commodities and data and transparency. I was in Italy a couple weeks ago and <clears throat> visited an agro-tourism operation and he bottled a couple hundred thousand bottles of wine. And he had a QR code on the back of his wine bottle where you could just zoom in with your iPhone and you could find out all about his family and his winery. And I noticed the same thing in my wine bottle in my hotel room here, where people connect using technology to connect with, connect growers with consumers. We're seeing a lot of interest in data and transparency and sustainability among our farmers and ranchers. But I'm wondering if we're thinking big enough. Are we investing in the R&D? Are we investing in the supply systems? Are we talking to that next generation about what we need to do to revitalize agriculture, not just in America, but around the globe? So I'd just like to leave that with you as a parting thought and look forward to talking to you and listening to our other presenters over the rest of the conference. So thank you very much. I got it. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Um, are there any questions that we have for Sarah from the audience? Um, Pat, do we have a, a microphone? If, if you could please introduce yourself. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, I had the privilege of going through those flyover states just a few weeks ago and um, driving through them, not flying over them. And uh, I concur with yeah, your, what you put up there. Um, oh, sorry, Jeremy Critch is my name. Uh, I think one of the issues we have with you talking about the millennials and trying to communicate with the consumer is a lot of the time they don't look at facts and science, uh, unless it supports their, <laughs> their argument. 
In Australia, for example, at the moment, South Australia can't use GM canola, even though all the science says that it's 100% safe. And then the consumer will look at climate change and say, yep, we agree with science. So they just pick and choose what science they want to agree with. How do we handle that? How do we deal with that? Uh, I would say that your concerns mirror much of the United States. And in fact, in the US Congress, we have people who say, you know, we have to deal with climate science. We were, we're seeing climate change. How can you be a climate denier? And then on the other hand, you'll have people say, well, we have biotechnology that can solve a lot of your climate issues. We can be more sustainable. We can, you know, so the science seems to be in the eye of the beholder for a lot of people. I would certainly agree with you on that. But I do think that there are um, generational issues that can be overcome with greater transparency and discussion. Um, I, I have two sons. One is a pure millennial. Uh, and you know we've had a lot of discussions with he and his friends about, well, where did you hear that? And, and, and you know, you're entitled to read whatever you want. But let's be thinking about, do you trust that source? And is it something that you think that is going to stand alone as a, as a fact after you've researched this? And, and I've been very pleased to see by having some of these discussions and opening up you know, farms and access to more information that we've been able to, to change some minds and to find some more middle ground on actually what, what is a, you know, a sound piece of science. So I, I do think it's possible, but I think it, it requires a lot of communication and education uh, on both sides, and people willing to not be so set in their ways that they're, they're not open to that there might be yet a third way, a second or third way. Uh, Pat, yeah, sorry, just the middle. Hi, thanks, Sarah. Kate Burke from Think Agri's, um, who I am. My, my question to you is, uh, if there was one difference to describe the impact of the, or the way Obama, um, the Obama administration ran agriculture compared to the way the Trump administration is running agriculture, uh, could you describe the major difference, I guess, and the impact that that does have on the people in, say, North Dakota and Iowa? Oh, and probably not a short answer, um, but I would say that the Obama administration had a lot of very talented people as well. Uh, Darcy Vetter, the U.S. trade negotiator, Tom Vilsack, our Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, but there was a, a frustration, I think, even from some of them that, um, you know, there, there, was, there was not an ability to move the ball perhaps as far as they would have liked to open up new trade uh, avenues and to, um, and that's not necessarily uh, the president's fault. Uh, it has to deal with a lot of other factors, but you know they were supportive of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and I think they would have liked to move quicker and just get it done before the Trump team came in, but they couldn't because there was a reluctance among several people in the party to go forward with that and make it even tougher for Secretary Clinton to advance. So that would, that would be one thing that was different. Um, the other is, of course, the administrator of the EPA became kind of a target, a whipping girl, so to speak, um, for the agricultural community because of the positions on WOTUS and the position on many crop chemicals. And so that was not viewed favorably. But um, there were a lot of things that the administration, as I said, they, they, they really had some good people trying to advance and expand markets but perhaps not as a, the speed and the, the coordination that um, we've seen in the early attempts from the Trump administration. Uh, whether they'll be able to continue at that pace, I don't know. But I did think it was interesting when I'm sitting there watching people get off Air Force One, and you've got national security, you've got commerce, you've got Purdue, you've got an, an ag advisor, and they're all with Trump, with Branstead, uh, and, and they all go back on the plane, and they're all still meeting throughout the night on their way back to Washington, and you know, they're, they're really impatient. I right, think we've, we've time for one more question. 
Just uh, Angus Thornton from uh, Pro Farm Australia. Look, I think one thing that has been agreed upon uh, in the aftermath of uh, Trump's election is that it was a reflection of increasing polarisation uh, amongst the electorate in which, uh, you know, personality and image was probably more Im important than ever. So given that, uh, you know, Trump was, you know, described as an outsider candidate who won, you know, effectively uh, against the odds, do you think this sets a precedent that at least for the short to medium term uh, nominees for president and, and other uh, positions of office from both sides of the aisle will uh, increasingly come from these sort of uh, outside lanes, uh, rely on developing a sort of a personality cult? Or do you think this will act as something of a circuit breaker to get the establishment wings of the party to sort of get their act together and either you know tap into the sentiment that saw Trump elected, or do you think they'll be able to sort of work to defeat that and get people back uh, and buying into the establishment uh, uh, messages that they're sending. Oh golly, um, you know, I guess maybe you could ask people in Minnesota who once elected um, Jesse Ventura that, um, you know, sometimes electing an outsider isn't always the way you want to go, but, um, you know, you, you can't, you can't deny that this is what happened with the voters. And they wanted an outsider. And one, I think a key point I will be watching is to see what happens in our midterm elections. And so, you know, every two years, we elect every member of the House. And every six years, a member of our Senate is up. And there are a lot of very nervous Republicans right now who think that they either need to really buck up against Trump or they need to be in line with Trump. And some of them who aren't in line with Trump are going to be primary. They're going to be challenged by members of their own party. And so if the Republicans who now control the House, the Senate, and the White House can't maintain their majority uh, in the midterms, I think there's going to be a dramatic rethinking of all of the Republicans. Um, having said that, the Democrats have just announced a new game plan called A Better Way, where they have insisted that they are now going to relate to uh, mainstream workers and those who had felt disenfranchised and were perhaps more attracted to the Bernie Sanders wing of the party. And so they're out with a big uh, trying to, to get mainstream candidates on their side as well. So um, I, I really just think it's too early to tell whether this is going to you know, be a totally that we're going to go to all outsiders or we're going to spring back and, and go to more mainstream candidates because we just really have to see what happens with the party going into the midterms. Right. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you very much. Right, we'll move now on to session three, which will be a keynote address by John Wagner, director of Brisbane West Camp Airports and Wagners. John, along with brothers Dennis, Neil, Joe, established construction materials and infrastructure company at Wagners in 1989. As one of Queensland's most successful family-owned and operated businesses, Wagners built Australia's newest airport, Brisbane West Wellcamp Airport, the first greenfield public built, sorry, private built public airport since Federation. John and his brothers built the multi million dollar airport, which opened in late 2014, to create connectivity to the Darling Downs region as a long term multi generational asset. The airport services around 74 weekly flights into and out of the region through airlines Qantas Link, Air North, Regional Air Express and Cathay Pacific. Wagner's started in Toowoomba as a small concrete operation and is today considered one of Queensland's greatest success stories. As a prostate cancer survivor, John is part of the founding com committee for prostate cancer charity It's a Bloke Thing which has raised more than $4 million for research and education since it started in 2011. I'd like to invite John to give the keynote address. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And, and uh, first of all, um, uh, around the room, I see a number of familiar faces that use WellCamp, and I'd just like to 
particularly thank those people for supporting us. And uh, without that regular travellers to Melbourne, Sydney, Cairns and Townsville, um, we wouldn't be able to maintain the airlines there. So thank you very much. And also uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to come and, and talk about uh, a well camp this afternoon. I'm going to just run through this quite quickly, um, this presentation, um, to allow you to get to lunch. But uh, essentially, um, uh, as the introduction said, uh, we're a private company, 28 years in business, owned by four brothers, started in Toowoomba. Uh, we're primarily a, a concrete and um, a concrete and construction materials business, um, and we, we cover a lot of regional Queensland, some international ports, um, and uh, primarily in the cement and fly ash businesses. So what that has sort of allowed us to do over the last 28 years, and we've been really restricted because we, we live in the second biggest inland city in Australia, in Toowoomba. Uh, town of 165,000, a catchment area of 344,000, the, the 11th biggest catchment in the country, and we didn't have an airport. Um, and we really found it difficult to run a multinational business uh, from a regional centre. Um, you know, we would have our international clients, from people like Bechtel from the US, that would would say, you know, which airline runs to Toowoomba? Well. The best we could do was uh, a greyhound bus for those people. So we got very frustrated, um, and we were very vocal advocates for turning our local defence force base, Oki, into a multi-user facility. And defence just kept saying, "No, no, no, it's not going to happen." Um, so we couldn't get the local council to think laterally. The state government didn't want to know us. So we decided to. Um, take the project on ourselves and um, we started to, to build the Wellcamp Business Park, so it's a five star business park. We've got 5,300 acres of real estate in one parcel at Wellcamp, just on the outskirts of Toowoomba. Um, and what we also found then is that we couldn't attract um, national and international tenants to Toowoomba because there was no airport and there was no connectivity. So in 2012, um, we decided uh, as a family to um, go ahead and construct uh, the first airport, public airport, uh, Greenfield Airport that's been built since Tullamarine 50-odd uh, years uh, prior. Um, we um, put an application to Council in June 2012. We had approval uh, late 2012 and we started construction early 2013 and we finished construction and had CASA certification uh, 19 months and 11 days later. Uh, what we built uh, was um, what we saw as um, a vital piece of in infrastructure but we also wanted to have a piece of in infrastructure that wasn't limited uh, for a regional centre. So typically in a regional centre you'll have a runway that's you know, somewhere between 16 and 1800 metres long, uh, somewhere between 30 and 45 metres wide. And we decided to uh, do something that would certainly allow us to be, op to be able to open the Darling Downs up um, to food uh, and produce exports, even though people time after time told me that that would never happen. I'd go to these airport conferences um, and for those that are in the business you can actually make a, make a career out of going to airport conferences. And we were there and um, you know, someone would walk up to you and say, um, so what are you here for? And well, I'm going to build a, a new airport in Toowoomba. Oh, that's good. What is it, a grass strip, is it? And uh, um, No, it's a 747 capable airport. And, uh, um, 2.87 kilometre long runway and they just roll their eyes and walk away and there was so much scepticism within the industry and within government and within everyone we spoke to really that this project was just a, a pipe dream um, and um, to a point where um, I went to Canberra early 2013 and I sat down with CASA, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority and and said, I'm just here to introduce myself. We've got approval. Um, and um, um, 
the CASA lady and head guy said, well, we've got two problems, John. First one is there hasn't been an airport built in 50 years, so none of us know what to do. Um, and secondly, you know, you've come along and said you're going to have this thing done in 18 or 20 months, and we think that's a load of rubbish. Uh, so we're not actually taking you or the project seriously. So I got my plans out and I went through them, and this is where we're putting the asphalt plants, we're putting the concrete plant, and guys, by the way, we've already started. So uh, get your head out of the sands and, and let's get on and uh, make this happen. And to their credit, um, the federal government bureaucrats really got behind the project. We pulled a working um, group together uh, of CASA, Air Services, Defence, Bureau of Meteorology, Department of Infrastructure and Transport. There's numerous departments that I don't know what they do down there, but they all turned up. And uh, we, um, we went through the process and, and it was a very calculated um, risk that we took because the land that we've got uh, where we're going to build the airport was actually in the defence's airspace. And everyone said to us, you will not get defence to give up any airspace. It just doesn't happen. Uh, so we decided to go ahead and start construction and uh, we effectively turned um, our problem into their problem and they had to get it organised. And to be, to, once again, to be fair to them, they, they made every excuse initially why it would take years and years to to re-engineer the airspace. Um, and you know, I used to run the line that, listen, we put men on the moon in the 60s, so surely you people can sort something in two or three months. And it took them five and a half months, but still it was a good effort and they've got a good result and so have we. With our airport terminal, um, we went and visited a lot of airports around the world um, and around Australia um, and everyone said to us, listen, just build a tent shed, don't waste money on a terminal, the airlines won't pay for it um, and um, j just keep it as cheap and as, as um, you know, normal as possible and, and we, t we took the view as a family that we didn't want to do that and given that it was the first airport built in half a century. Um, and first airport built without any government assistance since Federation. We wanted to actually make a statement, and a statement not only for the airport and for our family, but also for Toowoomba. So when someone turned up at our airport, they, they could see that it was a serious place to invest, that we had serious infrastructure there. And it's put us in extremely good uh, stead. When I was going to these airport conferences, I'd always go and meet up with the cargo guys, and, and they said to me, listen, you know, you're a dickhead, basically. Um, uh, freighters don't run out of regional ports. Freighters only run out of Sydney and Melbourne. Um, there's not a freighter service in Brisbane, so, you know, you're a dreamer. Um, and I wasn't really prepared to accept that thing because I, I could just see, you know, the rising middle class in China you know, all the protein requirements and, and the fact that our producers in our region, you know, we've got four or five major export accredited abattoirs within an hour or so of the airport. We sit in the middle of the, the biggest agricultural producing region in the country, highest concentration of feedlot cattle, I think, in the southern hemisphere. So why wouldn't it be a natural hub? And um, it, it took about um, close on 12 months to convince an airline, which was Cathay Pacific, to come and at least give it a go. So in November 2015, uh, we opened in, in um, November 2014, November 2015, Cathay bought a 747-800 in to test the water, I guess is the best way to put it. Now where's our, um, Damien, can you just run that short video please?
So ladies and gentlemen, that was the first time that a 747-800 jumbo has ever um, operated out of a regional port in this country. It's the first time a 747-800 has ever operated out of Queensland, ever. Um, and now, uh, 12 months on, we have a scheduled freighter service that comes in every Tuesday uh, and, and takes uh, a whole range of products up to Hong Kong. Uh, from Hong Kong it gets delivered to uh, US, Middle East, Bangkok, UK. Uh, it's absolutely amazing what, what goes um, in the middle of those aeroplanes. We expect um, and are confident that we'll get two a week uh, in April. Um, and I think ultimately, within a couple of years, we'll be seeing at least one aircraft a day running out of uh, our airport up to Asia. The demand is certainly there. The demand for uh, dedicated freight is rising exponentially. Um, the people, certainly in our region, now have got a conduit that they can get their produce out and get it out quickly. Uh, we, we are trying to convince the federal government, and I think we have them got convinced. I, I see uh, Joel here. Uh, he's on the wrong side of politics at the moment, unfortunately. Um, to realign inland rail to come via the airport. And what we've committed to the federal government is if they do that, um, and we believe that there will be the route will be finalised shortly, that we will commit to build a $60 million multimodal facility. So that's road, rail and air at Wellcamp. We have uh, four kilometres of rail frontage uh, on our property. Uh, and we believe that what that will do is open up the whole of sort of that central eastern Australia for, for fresh produce. The, the service offering that Inland Rail has is Melbourne to Brisbane in 20 hours on 1.8 kilometre trains, double stack containers. So, you know, from northern Victoria or southern New South Wales, they're up to our place in sort of 12 or 14 hours and can be uh, repacked. Um, onto an aircraft and up in, up in Asia sort of uh, eight or nine hours later. So we believe that with this vital piece of infrastructure, um, particularly with inland rail, the second range crossing and the demographic we've got in our region, we believe that we can really make a difference to the agricultural sector in this country. And I think what it has done, um, and we now have four MOUs with councils that want to link their airports with, uh, with Wellcamp, um, and it's really starting to get a lot of momentum now where people can see that they can use this piece of infrastructure to join up their particular airports and their regions uh, to lift the whole agricultural production. So um, just to close, it's absolutely critical that we keep, as a group, um, and as a nation, keep pushing the federal government to get serious projects like Western Sydney Airport, uh, which can be another major freight hub. Um, you know, get on and build this stuff. Stop talking about it. Stop doing reports. Stop doing reports on reports on reports, and procrastinating. Get in and and really get this uh, this whole infrastructure thing happening. So I'd just like to leave you with that thought and thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me and uh, if ever you're up in World Camp, we'd certainly um, be very happy to, to show you around and show you what we do. Thank you. John, I'll just ask you to stay here for a moment. Um, are there any questions that we have? They are shy bunch. So, so let me start the ball rolling. How, how, are you, how are your plans going, progressing for this Badgerys Creek project? When do you start? Um, well, 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 we um, made a public statement that we can, we can build Badgerys Creek in well under three and a half years from a, from a standing start. Uh, the federal government uh, are appointing Western Sydney Airport Limited. Um, and uh, they will have an independent board and independent management that will actually run the process. They've got an early works package coming out later in this year to shift the cemetery, shift the road, shift the high voltage power lines, um, and then effectively the airport will be ready for construction. 
Now, you know, the slated number is $5.4 billion, and uh, we've had Paul Fletcher, Malcolm Turnbull up at Wellcamp, and, and um, there's actually no rocket science with building an airport. There's a job of work to do, um, and, you know, they're relatively complex, but it's not that difficult. The thing that's become very apparent, though, is the Feds don't really know what to do, and their consultants uh, know even less. And I think one of the reasons, in my view, why Sydney Airport didn't take up the concession to run Western Sydney Airport, because the consultants just had fat on fat, uh, uh, contingency on contingency, and got to a number like $5.4 billion, and it just doesn't stack up at that. But you know, I think the number uh, is, is less than half of that, is what the, the true cost is. And the way that I worked that out in my truck driver brain is um, Western Sydney Airport, uh, their runway is 700 metres longer than ours. Uh, our, our runway is A380, 747, 800 capable. Um, so it's a code F runway, same as Western Sydney, but another 700 metres. Ours cost 80 million uh, to build. Um, so that's double it for the extra 700 metres, 160 doubled again, 320 doubled again, just, just for, you know, for good, good uh, luck. Uh, our terminal costs 31 million, um, 10 times the size for Western Sydney. Uh, car parking is similar, 2,500 car parks. Um, so go 31 million by 10. Um, 300 million, double it, and then double it again, then double it again. You, you just can't get to 5.4 billion dollars. Just, it just, it's just not there. So, you know, our view with the Feds is just let us get in and build it, and we'll give you a fixed price for a design, construct, and operate. And when you get into power uh, later next year, you'll be able to take up the, the cause there, Joel. Um, but we just need to get on and do this stuff. It doesn't take 10 years to build an airport. You know, it's already approved. So. And are you saying that people would have arrived here on time today had you been in charge a couple of years ago? Uh, no, this is Melbourne. No, um, from Sydney, from, from leaving from, from Sydney. From Sydney, so, yeah. And some of you may realise we started late because uh, the planes are a bit slow taking off from Sydney. So if we had you in charge... Well, it's actually an interesting point. It wouldn't have made any difference because was, Melbourne was fogged in. But Melbourne Airport, their terminals are now at capacity right now. Their runway will be at total capacity by 2020. So that's four years away, and they haven't started planning for a second runway. It'll be, end up like Brisbane, who got to capacity, then they decided to put another runway in, and it'll be ready in another four years' time, I think. So um, the lack of planning for these big pieces of infrastructure is a, is a, a critical issue. So that's my humble opinion. Time for it. We've got, Ooh, we've got time for a couple one. more questions. Sorry, sorry, Peter. I've jumped in, mate. <laughs> sorry. sorry. Put it down. Sit down, mate. Sit down. <laughs> uh, Todd Lees, Latima Brokerage. Uh, thanks, John, for your presentation. It was certainly an inspirational story. Uh, I'm guessing that uh, the mining sector played a significant part in your feasibility study of the airport. And I'm just wondering, with the downturn in the mining uh, sector, particularly in Queensland, uh, how have you managed that? Uh, event eventuality? Uh, well, it wasn't a big factor, of course, we didn't do a feasibility study. Um, <laughs> and the reason we didn't do a feasibility study is because we didn't know what it was going to cost, and um, the airlines didn't want to talk to us because there hadn't been an airport built in half a century. So they just said, well, you know, we don't really know how to handle this. Um, so we decided that we felt that we had the demographic in our region, given what I've said before, second biggest inland city, uh, biggest uh, ag producer in the country, uh, big health centre, big education centre, uh, a, a number of multinational businesses. We just felt that it was the right decision. And as a family, uh, we decided to do that without any commitments, without any customers, um, because we felt that it was the right thing to do for our region. And eventually, this thing would work. So. Um, the mining sector uh, hasn't played a part, in, in hindsight anyway, as a result of it. Uh, so we're a, a, a services sector for the Surat Basin, the Galilee Basin, to a lesser degree, Adani's about to get going up there, uh, the Cooper Basin and the Bowen Basin. So, you know, we're not talking big numbers, 
This is primarily a passenger airport, and where you make your money with an airport is through the RPT operators, Qantas, Virgin, Rex, and Air North, and those sort of people. Uh, the freight is a, is a side issue, um, and an airport typically doesn't make much money out of freight, but we broke the mould in this country as to how airports are run. So when you come to Wellcamp, uh, the lady in the Qantas uniform is a Wagner person, the people on security are Wagner people, uh, the ground handlers, baggage handlers, refuelers, we have our own tankers, um, make the coffee. Every, everyone on site is a Wagner employee. And as a result of that, we've been able to con control the experience, we've been able to keep our costs down, and by having people that are multi-skilled, we've been able to make money uh, and get a return much quicker than we actually ever intended that we would. So it's, it's been a quite a unique model, and we've seen other airports, particularly in regional centres now, changing their model uh, to do what we're doing. Peter. John, how long uh, do you think before we start seeing in regular inbound and outbound uh, passenger flights, and where do you think they will originate from or uh, depart for? You're talking international? Yeah. Well, l let me put it to you like this. Um, at the moment, there, Australia has about 1.2 per cent of outbound Chinese um, um, out about Chinese tourists, and currently, order of magnitude, there's a hundred and a bit million uh, Chinese travel outside of China each year. Uh, by 2024, which is six, seven years away, they expect that number to be in excess of 800 million Chinese leaving China each year. Now, when I look at the, the, the capital city hubs, Melbourne and Sydney in particular, uh, and Brisbane to a lesser degree, um, they're getting close to capacity. So I think particularly the, the Chinese regionals will start to talk to regional airports here, you know, people like ourselves, Sunshine Coast, Rocky Townsville, Newcastle, uh, the ones that sort of come to mind. And I think we've got a pretty good service offering with our, our tourism business uh, in our region and the experiences that we've got to offer. So I would expect uh, within a couple of years that we will see direct flights from Asia into World Camp on a daily basis. And that's what we're working towards.